Hey, it's Greg Stanley with the Collect Car Podcast. Now, for this episode, I'd like to recap some of the behind scenes for the weekend in which I went out to visit Jay Leno and tour his incredible garage. It was quite a weekend, Saturday until Tuesday morning, and I thought I would share that with all of you on this episode of the Collector Car Podcast. Okay, this is a call out to my listeners. I do not have a lot of sponsors for this podcast on purpose because I don't want to waste your time with products I am not crazy about. Well, I do have two that I am crazy about. The first one is LLC TLC. This is where you can save money on your car registration every year. You can set up a Montana LLC and pay no sales tax on your vehicle purchases, which is really amazing. Now, you can also permanently register your classic cars in Montana to avoid any annual renewal fees. And as your registered agent, LLC TLC will handle everything for you so you never have to step foot in Montana to take advantage of this incredible offer. Now, as a listener of this podcast, they are offering 30% off your entire package. Now, to get this, simply go to llctlc.com slash classic or mention this podcast when you call them directly my other big sponsor of this podcast is euro classics out of dayton ohio now that's euro classic with an x.com if you want to reach them in person you can reach them at 937-299-1311 now this is where i get all of the work done on my porsche i just had uh, my gto in there my mustang's been in there it is the place to go if you want awesome service at an extremely competitive price so when you go there, just ask for Dale and tell him that I sent you. Now, if you're not on my e-newsletter, please shoot me your email address, greg at the Collector Car Podcast. I will add you to it. I only do it about every six to eight weeks, and I guarantee it is worth your while. Most email open rates are around 3 to 5%. Mine is 42 to 52%. So thank you for all of you that are on my e-newsletter for opening and engaging with me that way. Okay, if you did get my e-newsletter update, you'll know that my meeting with Jay Leno, getting him on the podcast, took four years in the making. Now, I won't go over it in depth right now, but just let's say that the door was finally opened with the incredible 1966 Pontiac GTO that I recently bought and was able to share with him in Las Vegas while I was podcasting from the win for the Las Vegas Concours de Elegance. Now, it got me in the door because it is such an incredible car, such a unicorn, Uh, Don't know when it's going to be out yet, but I believe it will be out right before the Cincinnati Concours weekend. Uh, That weekend is around June the 9th, Uh, so I think it will come out June the 3rd, that Monday at noon. Now, if you like cars and you like Jay Leno, be sure to check out the Cincinnati Concours. I was able to score four tickets for a tour of Jay Leno's garage. Now, they're going to package that with airfare and a hotel, and I don't know exactly what it's going to look like right now i believe it will be some type of raffle ticket you'll have to buy but definitely worth the spend to get a chance to tour such an incredible collection so to start the weekend off i told my wife you know once we land we had a direct flight landed in la around 8 30 in the morning la time i wanted to hit some prime automotive highlights so the first stop was the nethercut collection i had never been to this location before. Always heard about it. Uh, I love listening to Cameron on Jay Leno's Garage, his YouTube channel, as he shares some incredible cars. They just shared a Hispano Sueza on the show, but it is unbelievable. Now I had reached out to Cameron, who is the grandson of the founder of this collection, and he was unable to meet this meet us because he was prepping cars for La Jolla. But to my surprise, he put our name on the guest list for a tour. So as soon as we shown up, Just by chance, we were like five minutes away from the tour beginning. So we started, there's two different buildings. Uh, We went over to uh, one of the buildings where he started on the first floor. The second floor is this. If you're watching on YouTube, it's the Grand Salon. Now these pictures are on my Instagram page. Stunning room, marble floors, pillars that go up two stories, incredible cars, Rolls Royces, Bugattis. There's this Gorgeous, dark maroon Bugatti with tan interior. That's absolutely unbelievable. Incredible, incredible cars. Now this tour was really amazing because you would learn not only about the cars, but they had a lot of musical instruments or musical players all over the place. Now these are not what you might think about that you put on your nightstand. Some of these are as big as a room. One of them, third largest in the world, actually has 5,000 pipe organs. It's absolutely stunning and unbelievable. Now in the pictures you're seeing here, there's some early Mercedes, some Duesenbergs, Rolls Royces, 
uh, brass era cars, Packards, all sorts of incredible cars at the Nethercut collection. Now what's cool is you'll continue up a couple floors and the top floor, the fourth floor, is where they have the music room and they would entertain and play these huge music players. Just a wonderful place. And then you would go across back to the main area where you would check in and there were rows and rows of incredible cars including uh, Pierce Arrows, they had multiple early 1930s Cadillac V16 cars, uh, all sorts of incredible, incredible stuff. And what's, what's funny is in the entryway, as soon as you enter, let me see if I can get the right picture here. As soon as you enter was, I believe it was a 1965 uh, Ferrari 275 Spider, kind of the evolution of the 250 short wheelbase California Spiders or long wheelbase. Absolutely stunning, beautiful. They only made 14 of them. And ironically, R.M. Sotheby's had one for sale down at the Miami auction. And since there's only 14 in the world, I've now seen two red ones within three months of each other. I had to ask if it was a Miami car and it was not. So it was amazing that I saw two different cars of those 14 within three months. Uh, just a stunning, stunning place. I would highly recommend going there if you get a chance, just north of Burbank, about eight miles or so beautiful incredible cars they had a Maybach which is the precursor to Mercedes buying that brand and partnering with them absolutely stunning and then the other building was full of these pre-war cars just rows and rows of these pre-war cars and all sorts of cool things to see as well uh, this shot right here is a row of Pierce arrows you can tell by the headlights <laughs> Uh, after the Nethercut collection, well, believe it or not, my wife really wanted to go to a tea room. So we booked this tea at two o'clock and I didn't really do a lot of work in figuring out where this tea room was. We just found one that was semi close to Burbank where we were staying because that's where Jay Leno's garage is. We get to the tea room, follow the GPS instructions. Turns out it's right there in the heart of Hollywood. Like it's right by Man's Chinese Theater, the Hollywood I walk of fame, whatever it is with the stars. We didn't check all that stuff out. We just went to the tea room, but I found it ironic that the one place I found was in the heart, like basically the Times Square of LA is basically what it was. So wonderful tea room. I had, I put my pinky up and everything. Um, very good. I, I definitely recommend it. It's the only one. I can't remember the name Chao or something like that. Definitely check it out. All right. Well, then after the tea room, my wife and I were able to catch up with this guy, Bruce Meyer, two time, podcast guest last time at the Wynn Las Vegas. Wonderful, great, super nice guy. His building is right in, in his collection is right in the heart of Beverly Hills, which is really kind of nuts. Unfortunately, it was raining the first two days that we were there, which is unfortunate, but he has one of the top collections I've ever seen in my life. And the way it's presented is unbelievable. You have these truly historic cars. Most of his cars either raced at Le Mans or at the Bonneville Salt Flats and they either won or placed in class. Just incredible, incredible collection. And if you'll notice, if you're watching online, not only does he have the car displayed in a wonderful way, but many of them have a huge black and white photograph uh, mural behind the car, showing the car in period at the specific race that is the, the car is celebrated for. Now, this first car I'm showing is, as an example, is 2008 Corvette CR, I'm sorry, C6.R, first in class, 2005, I'm sorry, 2009 Le Mans. The picture behind it is actually from the 1960 Le Mans race. He also owns one of the three 1960 Cunningham Corvettes, which you can see in the picture behind this yellow Corvette. The Cunningham Corvette, I believe, is currently at the Peterson on display, so it is not in his personal collection. Uh, just incredible layout. He has Clark Gable's 300S Cabriolet. What's really cool about that car is the, the factory luggage in the back has the luggage tag with his wife's name and address on it is very, very cool. Uh, the setup he has is just such a cool place just to hang out, some cool neon signs. Bruce also has the first production roof yellow bird, which is amazing. And then one of my favorite cars that he has, let's see if I can get to it. He has the very first production AC Cobra. He has a couple of the Brumos Porsches and the picture I took right now highlights the spoiler, the ducktail spoiler on one of the historic cars with the number 59 in red, white, and blue, made in Jacksonville underneath my hometown. I thought that was pretty cool, so I had to take a picture of that. Um, he has Bugattis. Uh, one of the other famous Porsches he has is a 1967 Porsche 910 
which was first in class, the 1969 Le Mans. If you go way back on my podcast, one of the first 20 or 25, Dale Oaks, a personal friend of mine, he's with Euro Classics, he works on my cars. He actually painted this historic Porsche 910 back when it was under its previous owner's care. So he's very familiar with this car. Uh, beautiful, beautiful cars. One of the most famous, let's see if I've got a shot of it here. One of his most famous cars that he owns is the 1961 Ferrari 250 GT short wheelbase uh, car that was first in class, the 1961 24 Hours of Le Mans. He has, and you can see it in the, behind this car, 1965 Bizzarini, first in class at the 1965 Le Mans. You kind of get what I'm saying here. Every car is significant in some way. He has a 1979 Porsche 935 Kremer K3. This is the one that was financed by drug dealers who eventually went to jail. This one won the 1979 24-hour Le Mans outright. Not only did it win its class, but it beat the much more powerful cars. And my favorite car probably in his collection is the 1957 Testarossa, uh, driven by Ken Miles. Now this one has too many wins to list, but just a stunning car. You don't normally see silver Testarossas, and this one's silver with red interior. Uh, you can see the historic picture behind it. Uh, back in the day when it was racing in a period. Very, very cool, uh, incredible cars. And what's great about these cars is he drives them. He takes them on rallies. He shares them. They're not just static displays uh, in his own collection. This is a great shot of the 1979 Porsche 935. Now, the story behind that one was interesting. He owned a car that the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum really wanted. He ended up doing a trade, and this thing was down in the basement, covered in dust. No one really cared about it, but he knew what it was. Uh, not saying the museum did not know what it was, but they were willing to give it up in order to get the car that they wanted from his collection, which uh, is very astute on his part. Okay, so Sunday was all about cars yet again. We started at the Peterson Museum. What was nice about meeting with Bruce Meyer first, he asked us what we were doing, and I said, boy, I hope we can get into the Peterson Museum. He said, well, let me make a phone call. So he made a phone call got us into the vault and uh, the vault has all sorts of crazy stuff you know the pope mobile grease lightning from the movie grease it had a, one of the three gold deloreans down there incredible cars now this crazy rally green rally green uh safari porsche you see here was in the front lobby along with this incredible 911 carrera that was set up as if it was in a matchbox box display which i absolutely love very creative wonderful setup uh, at the Peterson. Some incredible Porsches was a big focus. Uh, the pictures I'm showing right now are actually from the vault. A lot of pre-war cars. Uh, there's Grease Lightning, which is actually a hideous looking car in person. I loved it on the big screen as you do. This is the one at the very end where it has a plexiglass hood and it actually flew, which was pretty cool. I apologize that I haven't gotten into the Jay Leno weekend yet. Just trying to do a full recap because it was such an incredible weekend. One of the other cool cars I had on display was this Porsche uh, race car. I don't remember. I think it's a 917, but further further iteration, L&M Porsche plus Audi. Uh, reason I took this picture is I actually owned the diecast car from back when I was a little kid. So it was really cool to see the actual real car uh, in person. Some great, incredible Porsches on display at the Peterson. Just a great, fun place to go to. Uh, we also went to lunch there. Um, and the cafe is set up like uh, Myers, the Doom Buggy, uh, Myers, uh, Manx. And so all the colors and the, the tiki wood and all that kind of stuff um, looks really cool. It's a really cool place. And Bruce was like, you need to go have the, uh, the breakfast burrito. No matter when it is, it's a great breakfast burrito. But they didn't serve it when we were there. So I had the Bruce Meyer Cobb salad, which was kind of cool. Also, while we were with Bruce, I lamented the fact that I could not get in to see the Mullins Museum before it shut down. It shut down in February, and Bruce was like, well, you know, let me see what I can do. And so he got us in. It technically, the, the next day was the last day it was ever going to be open, and it was open for special guests of the museum, which I did not realize this. So we actually got in there the very last day. Stunning, incredible Volsans, Bugattis, uh, all Delahays, all sorts of incredible cars were there. And now we got there about 2.30. We were the, my wife and I were the last two people ever allowed into the Mullins Museum. 
there were maybe three other visitors walking around while we were there, maybe a little more, it's hard to tell. I see online that a lot of my friends were there either the same day or the day before, I'm not quite sure. And so we walked around, I did do a video walk around, almost running around because we didn't have a lot of time. And then we eventually got kicked out. We were the last two people to ever visit the Mullins Museum. Uh, and we were, we were kicked out because they were going to tear some walls down in order to get ready for the Gooding and Company uh, auction that if you're listening to this on the release date on Thursday, it is actually happening tomorrow on Friday. So be sure to check it out. So yeah, we got kicked out. We we're only there for about 30 minutes, unfortunately, before they kicked everybody out uh, because they had to get stuff ready. What I found fascinating is not only the incredible cars, but the tapestries on the wall uh, were all custom made of the cars or of the owners. And they were, it was like 15 feet tall. They were huge. And then this collection of barn find Bugattis with the original patina on them was just really, really interesting. I would love to have any of these. And, and I mentioned, talked to Jay Leno a little bit later on Monday, I mentioned we went to the Mullins Museum and he had an interesting comment. He's like, you know, everybody seems to think that their collections will last forever even after they pass. And he commented on how, you know, the owner had passed not that long ago, within a year, I believe, and the whole collection was already being auctioned off. His point was nothing lasts forever. You gotta remember that, right? One of the cars I really fell in love with, it's kind of hard to see, but is this all aluminum kind of gullwing Bugatti. Now I asked about it and they said that this was actually a prototype uh, where the sketches were created, but it was never built. Um, and then the owner, Mr. Mullins, he decided to build it and to make it just like it would have been based on Bugatti sketches. And they actually had the gullwing idea before it came out anywhere else. So they were gonna leave it in, um, bare aluminum to show the craftsmanship of the car. So hopefully that ends up in a nice home where it will be displayed and shown elsewhere. But just beautiful, beautiful cars. All right, so that was Saturday and Sunday, packed in as much as I could from a car perspective. I think we did really, really well. We actually drove right through Malibu on Pacific Coast Highway. I went by the Malibu Country Kitchen, where if you listen to Spikes Radio, uh, they used to visit there all the time. Ironically, when we drove through Malibu, it was pouring down rain. It was horrible, horrible weather trying to get up to the Mullins Museum. On the way back, it wasn't as bad. We were able to grab a little dinner, have a look in the ocean at a place called Duke's. That was really, really awesome. So let's get to the Jay Leno visit. All right, so we were told that the car needed to be there by 8 a.m. on Monday. I shipped it over with Reliable. I got there on Friday. So I didn't have to worry about that, but I knew I wanted to be in there as quickly as possible, as early as possible. So my wife and I showed up at 8 a.m. Now I must mention that the two daughters of the original owner and their significant other were also joining us. They did not show up until 10 o'clock per Jay's request just to keep it streamlined. So my wife and I showed up at 8 a.m. and they were taking all of the still shots of the GTO. They had it inside, it was looking beautiful taking a bunch of just still shots and the sweeping uh, camera shots. So for the next two and a half hours, we had plenty of time to walk around the entire collection. Now I did bring my camcorder, memory chip was empty so I could record a ton of stuff. I wanted to do a walk around his entire collection, but that was not allowed because they like, they like for whenever someone visits the collection for it not all to be known. So that when you go from one building to the next building, there's surprises. You can look all over the place and find new stuff, new exciting stuff. And it truly was immense. Some stuff that caught me off guard is I didn't realize the steam room and the restoration shop was a separate building. You had to kind of walk through a breezeway for that. Um, I was also overwhelmed by the amount of stuff on the walls from a picture automobilia perspective. I was asked by two different folks to see if I could find their posters artwork on the wall and I could not find either one. Not that it wasn't there, but there was just so much to look at. Uh, we were, so I, I wasn't able to take a walk, walking video like I wanted to, which actually benefited me in the future, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, so walked around, looked at all the cars, had to get a picture in front of the tank car. That's probably his most famous car in his collection. And that thing was truly immense. That was in the room of giants. I believe uh, most of the, Aero cars, the cars, pre-war cars that had uh, airplane engines put in them instead of the basic, you know, factory engines in them. Really, really cool stuff. So we were also limited in the number of pictures we could take. So I was only able to take maybe five to 10 pictures 
that I could post on Instagram, use to promote the podcast and everything else. So uh, I, obviously I took a picture of the black McLaren F1. You know, I took a picture of some of my favorite cars, a couple broad shots, that kind of stuff. Uh, so I wasn't able to take as much as I would have liked to. Now, one interesting thing about being on camera, which you, once you hear it, it makes a lot of sense, is that you cannot have any non-copyrighted material, which that totally makes sense, but it kind of gets into the finite stuff. It kind of gets into the minutia, which I didn't realize. So let me give you an example. The daughters of the original owner brought some incredible shirts. They did, the original owner was Bobby Morgan, and he raced dirt track sprint cars. And when he passed, they did uh, a mem in, mem in memory race for him and had these t-shirts made up. But one of the logos was of the sanctioning race body. So they couldn't wear that shirt. There was another shirt that they had from back when it was used at the service station. And it didn't have the U-Haul logo, but it had U-Haul, so we couldn't use that shirt. They had his original, which I, I asked for them to give me one of them because I think it's so cool. One of his original Sunoco service station shirts with his name on a, you know the classic patch. This is early 1970s and the name of his shop. I'll wear that every time I drive the GTO, if possible. Couldn't wear that shirt because it said Sunoco on it. The one shirt they thought they could wear was a t-shirt that had airbrushed of his dad's race car. And we couldn't use that shirt because we'd have to get the rights from the airbrush artists at the fair back in 1986 or whatever. <laughs> and you know, who's gonna go through that trouble? So we weren't able to wear any of the shirts they brought, but it was still really, really cool to see them. Now, one thing they did bring and they were able to wear, which I was so thankful for, and be sure to watch it on the video, is Bobby Morgan actually uh, he had a racing crew, and he made him these race jackets, really heavy, almost like a, uh, a Letterman jacket if you're uh, in sports in high school. Well made. I read the inside label. Looks like it was a high-end place that made it, and it was gold with red accents to match the gold with red accents of the GTO as well as the gold with red accents of his race cars. And so that was really cool. This thing's from 1966. Um, so one of the daughters, Tracy, wore it as part of the interview, which was really, really cool. So when Jay showed up, he was incredibly gracious. He made a point to tell us this is not a gotcha show. They edit. They wanted to make sure not only the car looked great, but we looked great. Um, and he reiterated that twice because we were kind of in two separate groups. And he made sure to talk to everybody and tell them that this is meant to be fun and enjoyable process. Um, it was fun because we had to figure out where we're going to where we're going to stand. Uh, we had to stop filming every time a loud airplane went over because it's right by the airport there. We did minimal redos. It was pretty much one take uh, throughout the entire thing, which was pretty cool. Uh, there was one part that I wanted to be sure that the teeth marks on the back of the passenger seat came up during the interview, and it hadn't come up yet. And so I brought it up, and Jay stopped everything for a second. And he said to Lisa, the other daughter, he said, Lisa, you haven't said much recently. Why don't you ask that question? And I thought that was brilliant because I had talked enough already. He wanted to make sure that everybody had some time on camera to talk. And it was her story because they were her teeth marks on the back of the seat. So that's, if you listen to the video you'll or watch the video, you'll see that's one of the main reasons I bought the car because I was sent the pictures of the teeth marks that was, quote unquote, the damage to the interior. So my thought was, all right, if these two little marks that are about the size of an eraser head the, are the only damage on the interior of this car, this car is in absolute immaculate condition. All right, so we do all the filming. Everything goes well. The sisters come in for the last part of the filming because it was a little difficult to have three people and Jay. So their part is shorter than I initially thought it would be. And now it's time to go on the test drive. And so we jump in the car. They load it, well, they load it up with cameras first, right? Uh, we jump in the car, start going for the test drive. Now, I pretty much have said all I wanted to say, so I was kind of struggling with some stuff to bring up. So I brought up, you know, my love of cars, how that started with my mom drawing kind of stick figures of cars. Back when I was a little kid, the first Mustang I saw in the driveway uh, growing up, my dad's buddy. So I went through a lot of that kind of stuff. And it was an interesting process. And it was also interesting that Jay stated, we, he can't do a CNBC show anymore, mostly related to the fees of filming in California. And the one example he gave me was as we're leaving his uh, hangar and we're, we're about to take a right, they have their route 
mapped out for all of these videos that they do on Sunday. They know exactly where they're going to go. They know where they're going to turn you know, where they're going to turn off and do all sorts of stuff. And he made the comment. He's like, "We're going to take a right here, but if I were to take a left, it would cost five thousand more dollars to have the rights to film on the same street, just in a different direction." And so the fees in California is really what's killing the the uh, film industry out there, unfortunately. So good news is, is he has his route planned. All of it's paid for for all the fees. So we take a right. We go on the trip. It was really, really interesting because there were a couple. He had a walkie-talkie. And so there were multiple spots in which we stopped. So he would drive. We would talk. And he'd get on the walkie-talkie. And we have the camera car in front of us. Sometimes it was behind us. Sometimes they knew exactly where you know, Jay was supposed to pass the camera car. All right, this is the stretch of road where he passes or does a crossover or whatever. And there's a spot in which I, it was a prop business. So they they would make props for movies. And Jay would get on the, the uh, walkie-talkie say, all right, we're going to the prop parking lot? And they would say yes. So we pull over there. And we pull over there so the camera folks can move all the cameras around to get different different angles. So we pull over there, sit there for a little bit while the camera guys do their work. And then we go down this next stretch. And as we're going down the next stretch, after a little while, he asked them, are we doing the bridge now? And they said, yes, we're doing the bridge. So he pulls over into a neighborhood while the camera car continues to go straight. And what he was doing is he was basically buying time to let the camera folks set up. So they continue to go. They go on the other side of this historic bridge and they set up over there. And then in the meanwhile, we're going down this neighborhood side street. He pulls over for a second. We just kind of wait for five minutes or so, and they give him the go ahead. And so he pulls out. And now this is where they kind of open the car up as they're going over the bridge. He lays into it more than I thought he would, which was awesome because the car did fantastic. And uh, so anyways, he flies by the camera crew, probably at 80 miles an hour. And, you know, they call him. They say, hey, you lifted off the gas a little too soon. Can we do it again? I'm thinking to myself, yeah, let's do it again, you know. So we did a, a U-turn, go back over the bridge, come back. He lays into it again, and blows back by. And then on the way back, we pull back into the prop, uh, the prop building, the prop building parking spot. I'm sure they have an agreement with them, you know. Hey, we're going to drop by here twice a day, and redid the cameras again, and then we get back into the shop. Now, when we left, we had put in an order for food. I had ordered a cheeseburger from someplace local. Well, everything took longer, I think, than people thought. The drive took longer. Our interview took longer, which I think is a good thing because we had a lot of stuff to talk about. And so by the time we sit down or we get our food, you know, he's got a bunch of tables set out. Nobody's sitting with Jay. I'm like, well, heck, I'm going to sit with Jay. This, I'm going to have lunch with Jay. So my wife and I join and the two sisters join, and we all have lunch together. My hamburger was cold, but it was still really good because we were that late. We were probably 20 minutes behind schedule at this point. Anyway, so... I had hit. I had been trying to get Jay on a podcast for years. Now, if you haven't listened to it, go back to a week ago and check it out. And so, when I knew I was going to be on the podcast or on his show for the GTO, I asked the producer, "Hey, while I'm there, can we do a, you know, do a quick little interview for my podcast? It'd be the 300th episode." They were super kind. They're like, yeah, I checked off with Jay. He said it'd be great. So when we're about finished up with lunch, Jay taps me on the shoulder. He goes, hey, you want to do that podcast? I'm like, yeah, sure. So we already had the spot picked out. Not the best lighting, you know, but who cares? You know, it's, it is what it is. I made the false assumption that I could use their audio video equipment. That was a big false assumption. So the the producer's like, hey, where's your camera? I'm like, I don't, I don't have a camera. He's like, what? And I thought, well, I thought I could could just use your stuff. I guess what it is is the film crew is probably a union hourly film crew with all their gear. I would have had to have rented them for another hour or so. And so the producer is a super nice guy. He's like, well, I could use my iPhone if you want. And then I remembered I had that camcorder that I meant to use to walk the whole collection, but I couldn't. So I had the camcorder ready. So I pull it out. I'm like, all right, I got a camcorder, but I don't have a tripod for it. And so he grabs like a, a box of whatever. There's stuff laying around on this coffee table. And to even it out just right, there was a, a comb on the coffee table. There was actually two combs on the coffee table. He grabs one of the combs and puts it underneath the lens cap. Uh, so if you look at the video, it looks poor quality, not great sound, but we kind of had to wing it, including a comb that we put underneath there. So Jay was great. I apologize. It was such a frazzled day, uh, including setting up the camera. I did not ask the listener questions. 
but I think I'll be back there in September. So when I interview him again, I would definitely ask four or five of the top listeners questions. I was just totally frazzled with everything that was going on. One thing I wish I had done and prepared and researched more for was for the ride in the GTO. I wish I had researched more of the evolution of the GTO past 1967, 66 into 67, you know, the style change into 68, the judge, all that kind of stuff, a little bit more. That would have been interesting to talk about while on the drive. Um, I will do that in the future. Um, one thing that was interesting is when I was having lunch with Jay, I mentioned his Aero Bentley. That wasn't a real Bentley, but it was incredible. Um, I'll throw a picture up here so you can see what it looks like. So basically pre-war Bentley, but built with an Aero engine. I just, I'm absolutely in love with that car. He's like, you know, the Rolls Royce right across from it with an Aero engine is a much better driving car because it has a six speed, I believe. I just thought that was fascinating and it would be really cool to dig into Jay's collection with Jay and kind of compare some like cars to get his impressions on which one's better driving position, speed, you know, drivability, whatever. So that's a goal of mine for the future. We'll see how that happens. All right. Now, the next guest, so he's doing two shows a day. Um, this particular week, he was doing 11 shows total. So we were in the morning, the GTO. Monday afternoon was the president of Dodge. They had the last Dodge Charger that was a police pursuit car there that they were going to film. I didn't have time to say hi to the president of the Dodge, which was horrible. Um, so he was busy for sure. Uh, but even still, he wanted to walk us around a little bit. He had just bought a Rolls-Royce Spectre, all-electric car. It was covered up. And as we're walking by, pretty much trying to walk out, let them do their thing, you know, he's like, hey, do you want to look at the Spectre? I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? You know, so he, he takes the cover off, rolls it up, opens the doors, has us take a look at it, and just tells us about the Spectre and how much he loves it, how quiet it is, how smooth it is. Uh, that, was, that was really, really cool. And he didn't have to do that. And then one thing that was behind, when you see the video of the GTO, if you look in the background, there's a big open area that's all black. That was the room with the Corvettes, but the lights were turned off because we're filming the GTO. And I couldn't go back there to look at the, um, look at the Corvettes. And so I said, oh, by the way, do you mind if before we leave, we just go back there and look at the Corvettes? He's like, no, 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 go back there and check it out. Well, he ended up going with us. He was actually being like our docent for his collection. <laughs> So he continued to walk with us. You know, he's talking about the Corvettes. I think I, I would ask him a question. I think he realized that I knew a lot about his cars, which I think he appreciated. It wasn't just someone walking in that didn't know anything about any cars, much less his particular car. So many, so many of them are one off. I think that he appreciated that and he wanted to walk and talk with us even more. And it continued so long that um, his producer had to come by and say, hey, Jay, we got, you got to leave. These guys have to leave. You got to film the next show. Uh, so he would have continued to walk us around if it were up to him, but he had work to do. So we had to go. So it was just absolutely incredible. Uh, that night, we, uh, we hung out with the sisters and their husbands and had kind of a celebratory dinner um, at the hotel and just talked about kind of like recapping our experiences each we did a big download of all the pictures you've been watching on YouTube here. Um, so a ton of stuff, absolutely incredible. I believe I'll be back on the show. I mentioned my Hypo Mustang Fastback that I found under a tarp during Amelia Island Car Week two years ago. And the producer did say, I want that on the show. And they're not filming again until like September. Uh, but my goal is, is to bring that car out and have that car. Cause that's, that's really a great story. And it's a true, not a barn find, but it's a true find of a really special car that is pretty beat up but it's it's raw it's patinaed and everybody seemed to love they love it the way it is so uh my goal is to take that out there and i haven't seen him do a specific video on his youtube channel about his gt350 65. Um, so my car was what turned into the 65 gt350 so my pitch was is well let's put the car side by side Let's talk about what makes a Hypo special, but then let's talk about the changes to take it from a Hypo to a GT350 and a GT350R, and they seem to like that idea. So if all goes well, I'll be back out there in September. Um, if you would like to see this Pontiac GTO in person, like I said, go to the Cincinnati Concord Elegance on June the 9th. 
You can also go to the Pontiac Nationals in Norwalk, Ohio. I'm trying to get the car up there. That's around July the 21st, 19th, 20th, somewhere around there. And then the big show is going to be at Macaque and Muscle Car and Corvette Nationals up in Chicago the weekend before Thanksgiving. The car was accepted for their red carpet invitational. And one of, I think, eight GTOs that was accepted for the red carpet invitational. So that will be up there. And they're celebrating 60 years of GTO. So that's a true honor. With being gold with red accents, it should look really good on the red carpet. So I'm very excited about that. Those are the three times you'll be able to see it if you can't get to some of the cars and coffee events here in Cincinnati. So as always, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And I will talk to all of you next week.